What's up guys? It's your boy Cody Joe back with another video. Just kidding. Well, this is Cody Joe uh, and I am back with another video. Uh, anyway, enough of the jokes. Uh, so, last video I spoke about the Australian olive python and I said I was just gonna kind of each video pick off another species from the Lyasis genus. Uh, but I realized it was probably necessary that I follow the Australian olive python uh, with the Papuan olive python, although it's not technically a member of the Lyasis genus, uh, at the moment anyway. Uh, so this is Apodora papuana. However, throughout the years they have been kind of reclassified and put in and out of the Lyasis genus. Uh, although. You know, besides, uh, I guess, genetic information, which all of these videos, none of them are really going to be too scientific. It's all just going to be, you know, my personal experience and opinions of these snakes. I'm just trying to showcase them, uh, get some more people into the species. Uh, but not speaking genetically, just with my experience keeping them, uh, I don't believe they should be a part of the Lyasis genus as much as they do kind of resemble uh, all those other pythons. They're very different, uh, a very unique species uh, that I believe should stay in their own genus. Uh, you can see, sorry, this, this thing's a bit of a handful. First thing you'll notice is the head. It's got this really weird kind of square bulldoggy head different color from the body, it doesn't really look like it belongs on this body. And then they've got actually a massive, massive forked tongue. Um, but for some reason, every time I get this girl near the camera, she just stops tongue flipping. Uh, so maybe you'll get to see it. Uh, but some other cool characteristics uh, would be the inside of the mouth on these guys is black along with this skin is black as well, uh, which is pretty unique for a python. Let's see. And I don't know if you'll be able to see the skin under there, but. Yeah, really cool. And one of the coolest things about them is they actually have the ability to change colors. Uh, it's not like you know, the snake isn't going to turn red or anything, but I guess you could relate it to like a crested gecko, how they'll fire up uh, and go from, you know, like an orange to like a blood red or a gray to a black. So these guys will do the same. Uh, you can see her head's fairly dark, but it'll change to like a, like a really light gray with some dark speckles. And then the body has the ability to go... Sometimes it'll be almost jet black, uh, whereas other times the top half will go almost black and the sides will go this like bright lime green. Uh, or sometimes it'll just be a solid olive green, uh, which this girl at the moment is kind of like an in-between phase. And then when they're in shed, the whole snake goes bright blue, uh, kind of like a kind of like a blood python. Uh, but same thing, like the top will be dark and then the sides will be really light blue. Uh, we'll see. This girl's quite a handful. Maybe I'll drag the male out because he's in full shed right now just to give you an idea of what it's like. This is pretty interesting. Yeah, she just refuses to show her tongue to the camera. But they just have a massive, massive forked tongue, these guys which is also like black, bluey black. Uh, something you hear quite often about these guys is, uh, you know, that they're, they've got to be pound for pound, one of the strongest species of python, which if you ever hold one, uh, you'll know what I mean. As much as it's a very, you know, lean bodied snake, looks real soft, it's extremely muscular. Which I find, honestly, I've kind of noticed that with a lot of species of snake that eat other snakes. Uh, they're typically quite muscular. And these guys in the wild are known to eat things like scrub pythons. Um, they'll eat each other. 
it's been very rare to find these guys captive bred. Uh, and a lot of guys who have been successful or attempted it have lost males to the female. Which even last year, um, I tried to breed these guys. You know, I was raising up my male to a suitable size because I didn't want them to get eaten. Uh, and I thought I actually had it. I had, they were copulating every day for two, three months. The female went off food. Uh, she had massive follicles, like uh, bigger than chicken eggs. And she was laying upside down, inverted every day, basking. Uh, you know, everything that a gravid python would do. And I was warned not to take the male out till the very end because they'll fool you due to the follicle size. They're so huge that you think that they're, you know, already gravid and they have developing eggs in there. Um, but I seen another fellow on one of the groups had paired his and in the morning came down to uh, a 10 foot male inside of the female. So I got a little bit nervous and I figured the job was already done, separated them. Uh, and then next thing I knew after a while, the female was back on food, shrunk down in size, and uh, well, here we are next year. So hopefully I can try these guys again this season. Uh, basically the way that I honestly triggered the female last year besides cooling and doing all the typical stuff was I just pounded the food to her. Um, I was giving her rabbits. And that seemed to stimulate follicle growth along with the, you know, the pairing of the male. Maybe can kind of see. But yeah, hopefully be successful this year. Uh, there's definitely some sort of trick to it. Uh, these guys, I guess, still comparing them to the Australian olive. Uh, I don't keep them nearly as warm. These guys seem to like it a little bit cooler, so I have them where they're at is kind of on an exterior wall. Uh, and their basking is provided with heat tape, although I will eventually be moving them over to basking lights like everybody else. Uh, but I keep their basking surface on the heat tape uh, 88 and then on the far end of the cage, on the cool side, it's typically like 78. Uh, and then the rest of the cage gets up to 80, 82 degrees. Um, I keep them in PVC cages. They're in eight foot PVCs, but just like the olives, like everything, you know, I would like to upgrade it because uh, they will definitely use the space. Uh, I find these guys can be rubbers. Like if they don't have enough space, then they'll, you know, rub their face along the glass until they start to rub their nose. So you definitely need to you need to give them enough space, but feel it out based on the individual. Uh, another thing with these guys, they've got like very soft scales. Uh, they damage quite easily. So typically, when they come in, uh, I notice they've got well, usually tons of scars. This female's almost mint shape, uh, but the handful that I've had. I noticed there's always a lot of scars around the neck area and the only wild footage I was ever able to find, uh, there was a video, I can't even remember what it was called, but a guy went to New Guinea, they were looking for croc monitors and they actually found a big popwin python in the jungle uh, and it was caught in a noose. So I wonder if that's often how they find them in the noose uh, and that's why they always have those scars around the neck area, potentially. But yeah, super cool species, uh, highly iridescent, like I said, really soft, extremely muscular. They're usually quite mellow, uh, and you might hear her kind of puffing. Uh, they kind of remind me of like a carpet python or a gaboon python, or sorry, gaboon viper. Uh, they're very nasally and huffy and puffy. But it's not actually a hiss, it's just like a huffy snake. Stretch her out a bit here. And this snake, the camera doesn't 
entirely show it, but she's probably around 12 feet. Uh, she's wrapped around my ankles actually now. But yeah, just incredible species. Uh, quite rare, but if you ever get the opportunity to get one, I would definitely recommend it because they're usually not aggressive. Um, they can occasionally be cage defensive, but they'll do this weird thing where they'll just kind of, I don't know, for as muscular as they are, they'll half-heartedly throw their body at you uh, and kind of headbutt you rather than actually biting you and they'll show that black mouth off too uh, they'll stand up open their mouth throw themselves at you a little bit <laughs> I really wish you would show the tongue but not cooperative what's new uh, yeah always really good feeders they shed pretty good, even if they do ever have a rough shed, uh, it never seems to stick. Like you can just peel it right off. You don't even have to really soak them. <laughs> there they got my ankles wrapped up. There you go. So yeah, hopefully I can reproduce these guys this year. That would be very nice. Uh, I would have myself a lot more holdbacks, as per usual. Oh my goodness. And if you ever do <laughs> get the opportunity to hold one of these guys, you'll see what a chore it is track of them. Yeah, you kind of see how velvety and even like you see the scales just fold right up like she just shed yesterday. She was coiled up in the hide box and she's got a bunch of scales all folded up which is quite typical of them. Yeah, that's the Poplin Python. Uh, figured I would show you guys before I dove into more of the Liasis. Uh, it was necessary to show both all the Pythons back to back. And we'll see here. I'll put her back and I'd like to kind of let you guys get a glimpse of the male. Just because I find it really cool when these guys are in shed how blue they actually are. Going back in the cage shot. It's funny too, I find it worth mentioning. Uh, when I was originally getting these guys, I had gotten an Indonesia import list and they were actually on the list as just as all of Python uh, and the Latin on there too was labeled as Liasis olivaceus which is the Australian all of Python so when I first ordered them I actually I just assumed because the Liasis all of Pythons they're not found in Indonesia. Uh, so I did kind of just take a gamble on them, assuming. And of course, uh, it was Poplin pythons that showed up. But the few times where I've ordered them from Indo, and it's quite common, you'll find this, you'll order you know, a pair of babies and you'll receive like a six, seven foot animal and like a 12 foot animal as a pair, I guess. 
uh, which more often than not, they end up being females. The males are quite rare to come by, uh, whether it's because the females are eating them or you know, they're in different parts of the jungle, I have no clue. But. So this is a male, he doesn't mind tongue flicking because he can't see nothing. <laughs> but you can see the sides are just super light and this male is always really good looking like he's never really in his dark phase. Um, so you can tell when he's not in shed, he's not blue, right? This is all lime green, and then the top is almost black. And again, real lean snake, but super long and muscular. Uh, and with muscle comes weight. So as much as they don't seem very big, they're actually you know, pretty heavy snakes. And typical, I find them to be quite easy to sex, like. You know, you can see the hemipenes go to like right here, somewhere in there. So you could almost just look at them and sex them. Like most of these pythons. There's the thumb. Yeah, super cool. Like I said, my you know my main kind of goal with these videos is basically just to kind of you know ramble on, uh, show you some species that are not often showcased, and just kind of give them some appreciation. Like often when you see these things, it's just in a quick video clip. Nobody really goes into detail about you know the unique characteristics of them. And for me, anyways, when you actually get to experience it, they're just incredible. Like, you know, if you've got a collection of boas or ball pythons or whatever, uh, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, you should consider, you know, just adding some of these less common species because when you get to experience them, it's, uh, you know, it's a game changer for sure. And same thing with this guy, real mellow, he's not too concerned about much. I've never honestly really had a Poplin Python be aggressive. Uh, the only thing I've ever really had is, I did have a really large female. And she was just nuts for food. Uh, I've actually had her smash a few cleaning bins, like I'll try and put her in a big rubber maid. And she would bite onto the side, throw coils around it, and squeeze it until the bin would smash. Uh, but she unfortunately passed away. I believe it was to old age because she was huge. All right, on there, pal. But yeah, there you go. Popwin olive python from New Guinea. Uh, next week I'll probably hop back into Liasis and uh, I think in, we'll probably go continue with biggest to smallest and do MacBot Python. Alright, see you in the next one.